Hello and welcome to this week's edition of 50 Years Serving the Island, a series of programmes featuring material from Manx Radio's archives during the station's first five decades serving the public in the Isle of Man. In 1968, Manx Radio was transferred into public ownership to become the island's public service broadcaster. This week we bring you part of an edition of Sunday Magazine from August 1980, Presented by David Callister, his guest in this edition was Mark White, former head of BBC Radio 1 and 2, and in his retirement years, Mark was very much a guiding hand behind Manx Radio. We join the programme here just in time to hear some classic commercials. Yes, hello, Mary Lou, Young Ricky Nelson there, and hello, Mary Lou. It's seven minutes past eleven. Ladies, don't miss the special offer now on at C&E's popular home freezer centre. Fresh frozen chickens weighing £2.14 ounces and now only £1.45. That's right, nearly a £3 bird for only £1.45. pence. And that's not all. Every Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday with purchases of £5 or more, you'll receive a dozen fresh eggs absolutely free. So, be an early week shopper and save pounds at the home freezer centre in Howard Street. That's opposite Woolworths. Discount Frozen Foods from the Home Freezer Centre. 219 Records presents Harvest of the Sea. See the excise men are coming to find it for hero. They'll be seeking wine and whiskey. See find it for hero. The Manx Festival Chorus, conducted by John Bethel, sings the Manx Fisherman's Evening Hymn, the Manx National Anthem. Ellen Vannon and Smuggler's Lullaby. 219's Harvest of the Sea, produced by Charles Gard, is available at leading record shops throughout the island. In case of difficulty, ring Manx Radio Sales on Douglas 24336. You're listening to Sunday Magazine, and today's guest is the former head of BBC Radio 1 and Radio 2. He's the retiring chairman of Manx Radio's Management Committee, one of the most influential presenters of jazz to the great British public, and has a wealth of experience in broadcasting and television, the concert stage, and the recording industry. And we shall hear later, he's also a writer. It's my very great pleasure to welcome this morning Mark White. Mark, good morning. Good morning, David, and thank you. I, don't, I want to skip all the biographical uh, growing up childhood bit, please, if we may, and go on to what I call the golden days of radio. I don't know if they were golden to you, but you were in them from a very early stage. When, when did you come into radio and how did you get at it? I came into radio in the early 40s when I came out of the army. I went to the army in 1939, came out very early on, went back into advertising, which I'd been in before the war, uh, advertising was, as you can imagine, in the doldrums with a major war on, and uh, I saw an advertisement in the Daily Telegraph which said that the BBC was looking for something called Recorded Programmes Assistance. And as uh, one of my hobbies at that time was playing records, I thought how marvellous to be actually paid to do what I enjoy doing at home, and probably in the process I can learn all about radio. So I applied for the job. Um, was astounded to receive a letter saying that I'd got it, and only then did I realize what precisely the job entailed, and it turned out that it wasn't playing records as I thought it was. Trust the BBC to have a job called Recorded Programmes Assistant, which had nothing to do with gramophone records. <laughs> um, however, I took it anyway and went on from there. What, what did it entail then? Well, in those days, you recall before th uh, the days of tape machines, everything was recorded on disc, and there had to be teams of people, all of whom I was trained to be one, to um, supervise anybody coming in to record from the studio end, not from the technical end, and also, of course, for playing those um, recordings on the air when the time came for transmission. Yes. So, I mean, it is true, I joke about it, but it is true that it was recorded discs, but it wasn't, as I'd hoped it would be, commercial discs. So if you made a mistake during the process, uh, you had to start again at the beginning, did you? Absolutely. Did this happen to all the, like the half-hour variety shows and so on? Yes, they were all recorded on discs, and what's more, they had changeovers. 
between one disc and another, and some of them were, were musical, which yeah. could be a bit tricky, yeah. and some of the speech programs uh, could be tricky because if suddenly the producer decided that he wanted to cut a piece out and there was no opportunity of doing a re-recording, mm. you had to do a thing called a jump cut, yeah. which was that you marked the disc up where it came out with a yellow pencil and where it came in with a yellow pencil, and you quickly faded it out, jumped the pickup across to the next yellow mark, faded it up, crossed your fingers and said a small prayer. <laughs> that is what they would now call hairy, I suppose, but listeners really never knew that this went on, did they? Not if we did our job properly, they didn't. <laughs> did it ever go wrong on you? Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> more than once, but I don't want to talk about <laughs> that. <laughs> so you, I suppose you thought, oh, I'm going to be a disc jockey, but I suppose the term disc jockey hadn't been invented quite then, had it? No, it hadn't. That came, it was an Americanism. Uh, absolutely, uh, which grew out of the war years, as I recall. Now, you came into uh, jazz fairly early on because you were a pioneer in the broadcasting of jazz. D did the sort of BBC management feel that uh, this was a not the done thing to put jazz music on the radio to the British public? Well, I wasn't the first, and I must give credit to the man who was and who actually broke the barrier, and that's a man called Charles Chilton, who became a very celebrated radio producer, um, and who started before me a thing called Radio Rhythm Club, which was the first to introduce, amongst other things, Harry Parry and his Radio Rhythm Club sextet. And it was really Charles who broke the establishment barrier that jazz wasn't quite a nice thing to have on BBC Radio. Mm -hmm. So that particular barrier had been broken by the time I came along with my idea. So you started, uh, what was it, BBC Jazz Club, you yes, called it? Yes. Using, using British uh, musicians, mostly? British musicians almost entirely, because although there were some visiting Americans, um, mostly they weren't allowed to play, you know, the old wrangle between the British Musicians Union and the American Federation of Musicians. Yes. Uh, who were the early names that you were associated with on Jazz Club, then? Um, well, of the ones that people are likely to remember, George Chisholm is an obvious one, uh, Tommy McQuater, the, one of the lead trumpet players from the Squadronaires at that time. Uh, oh, you foxed me to go back that far. Right. Uh, Let's move on to the, the, the bands then, the dance bands. Um, you, I think you were associated for some time with Henry Hall, were you not? Not really with, the, with Henry Hall's dance band as such, but with a program which came later, um, after I joined the BBC, called Henry Hall's Guest Night. I think yeah. one wants to differentiate between, um, you, you used a phrase, the great days of the dance bands. Well, really that was before the war. Yes, in the 30s. In the 30s. Yes. That was the great days of British dance bands, and American ones as well, but I mean, since it was BBC Radio, it was British dance bands, and they were literally the equivalent of the pop groups of today as far as the public was concerned. Yes. But Henry Hall's Guest Night was a program which featured the entire Henry Hall Orchestra but had guests of every conceivable sort on it from straight actresses and actors doing little pieces from the plays that they were appearing in to variety artists, singers, everything. Yes, and uh, of course he made that phrase famous, didn't he? This is Henry Hall speaking, and tonight is my guest night. I mean, people even quote that today. I yes, and I can tell you a funny story about that, because much later when I was doing a record program, looking back, a retrospective thing, uh, I wanted Henry Hall's voice saying just exactly that, and I thought this would be the simplest thing in the world, just bring up the archives people, and they'll send me a piece of tape which says, good evening, this is Henry Hall speaking. Mm. Didn't have it, so I had to ring him up and persuade him to come into the studio and record it special. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it, really? And Jack Jackson, too. You worked uh, alongside and with Jack Jackson for a lot of your career, didn't you? Yes. At the time that I first met Jack, Jack, of course, had given up his band. He gave up his band mm -hmm. during the war years, and a lot of people are not aware of the fact that uh, amongst his uh, talents, he was an extremely good artist. And during the latter part of the war years, he was not band leading or doing anything of that sort at all. Uh, he and his wife had about half a dozen girls working for them in a little studio attached to their home, and they were doing cartoon films for the Ministry of Information. Were they? Of course, before that, he was, he was a trumpeter, basically. A very fine trumpeter, one yeah. of the best jazz trumpeters Britain's ever produced. Yes. What about Jack Jackson's record roundabout and the the crazy mix of comedy and music that he pioneered. I mean, there's been nothing quite like it since, has there? No, people have said that the nearest uh, to it has been Kenny Everett, and there is a certain truth in that, but I wouldn't accept it myself. But I'd like to make it clear about Jack Jackson's record program, which is what you're referring yeah. to, Record Roundup. Now, that was a program uh, which I never had anything to do with at all. I was never associated with that. And it arose, I like to think, because I was the first person to use Jack Jackson not as a band leader or as a musician, but as a compare, as an introducer, on a program called Band Parade. 
yeah. which he did uh, so well that then the idea for the record show came up and that was done by a different producer in a different department. But he was a, a absolutely one-off as far as all the, uh, the jokey things. I mean, nobody until Jack Jackson had ever dared do things like putting on a record and let it play for 16 bars and then take it off and smash it and say, that's the last time that fellow appears on my program, <laughs> yes. which was not, not the done thing at all. And we're talking, of course, still in the days of the light program, as it was then, the light program and the home service after the war. And there was a program which was very, very popular, ran, I suppose, most of my lifetime, called Housewife's Choice. Yes. Did you have anything to do with that? I had never had anything to do with producing it. I was um, in the 50s after I left the BBC and was a freelance. Um, I was, on occasion, asked to actually present it, which was a very great honour. I think I did two stints on it and wasn't asked back, so I deduced from the fact that I wasn't very good at it, probably. <laughs> uh, once again, that's something which uh, uh, Jack also uh, was a slight pioneer, because he was invited to do a stint on Housewife's Choice, and if you can believe it, was had up in the office of the head of the department who produced it after the first programme and ticked off for being too jokey and too jovial simply by saying, guess what, he said, good morning ladies, which wasn't considered to be the done thing at all. <laughs> what had you to say then, was it good morning housewives or... or that was, there was a formula, you see, oh, yeah. you said good morning housewives and yeah. if you didn't do it, um, well, you were in trouble. <laughs> Well, of course, that, uh, we're talking then about um, the remnants of the wreath Im image, I presume, are you? Because uh, everything was very formal at that stage, wasn't it? Yes. Scripted and so on? Yes. I think I wouldn't like to put a date on the time when programmes ceased to be scripted because they had to be and became ad lib. But certainly at that time, everything was scripted. And all those early Jack Jackson record shows, which sounded so ad lib, were all scripted. Yes, well, he couldn't ad-lib those, really, no. in fact, no. Uh, I, I remember one of the early, uh, our friend Tim Gudgeon did one of the early sort of breakthrough programmes, I think it was called The Music Box or something yes. such like, uh, where he was allowed freedom to um, ramble on. And then, of course, the Northern Dance Orchestra with Roger Moffat had a little bit of freedom. I, I think yes. it really started about that time. Yes, it, it did. I, I think you're probably, on a rough guess, you're talking about the early 50s, my guess is you're talking about 52, 3, 4, something like that. Yeah. Well, let's move to the 60s now, and uh, the time when the revolution in radio happened, really, I suppose, with, with the pirates uh, upsetting anti-BBC, I suppose, for quite a long time. Well, not so much upsetting anti-BBC as upsetting the government. Yes. Because the government was getting complaints that they were broadcasting illegally on frequencies belonging to other radio stations and indeed interfering with shipping and coast guards and all sorts of other things. Yes. But the BBC was a bit reluctant to set up this sort of non-stop pop, I suppose, was it originally? You mean Radio 1? Mm. The, the BBC was most reluctant to set up Radio 1, didn't want to do it at all. Mm. But you were in on the beginning of this. Yes. Um, so what, how did it all come about and uh, what happened? How did you uh, recruit people and so on? Well, it came about really because the government had left the pirates into such a state that they had to um, bring the axe down finally. And the BBC was more or less told, well, you've jolly well got to do something about it. And the, <coughs> the BBC said, well, if we're going to do that, we really need more money and we need more needle time. And they said, well, you just have to do the best you can because we can't guarantee you any of those. So what in fact happened was that the old light programme, which used to go out on 1,500 metres long wave and 247 medium wave, was simply chopped down the middle. What was left of the old light programme stayed on long wave and 247 mm -hmm. became the Radio 1 frequency. And when you say, where do, how do we go about getting disc jockeys, uh, we quite straightforwardly uh, pinched the best of the pirates, who had been sunk, as it were, and um, I like to think that we did invent a few of our own. Um, notably, one of the early ones on Radio 1, uh, well, a lot of people forget it today, was Jimmy Young. Yes, yes, that's right. He went, of course, moved to Radio 2 very, very successfully, and I suppose the, the biggest success story on Radio 2 is, uh, is Terry Wogan. Um, there's a funny story about he, how he arrived at the BBC, isn't there? Yes, there is. Um, tapes, as you can imagine, and Manx Radio is no different from the BBC or any other radio station. Tapes come pouring in from would-be presenters, disc jockeys, announcers, call them what you will. Uh, if the BBC, there are so many that there are usually two or three people in different departments whose job it is to sift all of these out, and then there are audition sessions at which a panel of people sit down and listen and decide who's worth pursuing and, and who isn't. And... Um, a tape came in one day, the producer who was in charge of these things brought it into my office and he said, look at this, How, what, what kind of people can it, what kind of person 
can send us in a tape and hope to get a job when the tape is not only wound back to front, it's also inside out on a single-sided spool. <laughs> And I was so intrigued by what kind of a person could be idiotic enough to do that, I said, well, you know, this is worth exploring. Take it to bits, put it back the right way, and let's have a listen to it together. And he brought it back about half an hour later, and, and, and it turned out to be Terry Wilk. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, what, you invited him over for a His first short but t Terry at that time was the chief announcer on RTE in Dublin. Mm. And uh, with, through the cooperation of RTE, the first broadcasts he did to Radio 2 were done from the RTE studios. We sent a producer over and he did some programmes for us from Dublin. Now, uh, local radio has grown very much uh, since the, these days. Um, in fact, uh, I suppose it's taken a great, great chunk of the national radio audience. Um, how do you see the, the position of local radio for the future? Do you see it as uh, an ongoing, growing thing? I, I certainly see it as an ongoing and growing thing. I, I would uh, argue with you, I think, that it has taken a large chunk of the national radio audience. Um, it's my belief that most of the people that listen to local radio, whether particularly commercial local radio, to a lesser extent BBC local radio, are people who didn't listen all that much to national radio anyway. Mm. I think local radio is a thing entirely on its own. Uh, I have personally been one of those heretics who could never really see why the BBC got itself involved in local radio. To me, local radio ideally should be commercial, and to me the logical time to have introduced it was in 1955 when they introduced commercial television, in which case we would have been saved all this hassle of, uh, that we've had over the past few years of the, the growing up pains of both BBC and commercial radio. Yeah, is local radio to the BBC uh, an expensive item? Well, all radio is expensive, and I forget how many stations they've got, 20-something yeah, stations and more. more in the pipeline, and you yeah. can't run it cheaply, even if you run them on a shoestring with the absolute minimum of staff. Mm. So it is certainly, it, if the BBC were to abandon local radio, uh, which is, I think, what you're getting at, it would certainly save them a fair sum of money, but yeah. it would only be a drop in the ocean compared to this figure of 130 million that they say they've got to save somehow. Would you see a place for a national commercial network? Uh, a national commercial uh, station? As an alternative. Hmm. Uh, I mean, the big one for the commercials. I would have thought that if, thing, if, if commercial radio had come earlier, that that would have been the sensible and logical thing to do, but, I mean, there's no going back on the present system, it seems to no. me. So I think that's really speculation yes, that's, that's of, of something that might have happened but, but won't now. You're listening to 50 Years Serving the Island, a series of programmes featuring material from Manx Radio's archives during the station's first five decades serving the public in the Isle of Man. Today we bring you part of an edition of Sunday Magazine from August 1980, where David Callister's guest was Mark White. And it's now exactly 11.30, and guest on the programme today is Mark White, formerly uh, the head of uh, Baby BBC Radios 1 and 2, but um, we've been talking about radio a good deal during uh, 15 minutes. Uh, I would make it clear, though, that uh, Mark hasn't always been with the BBC, he's not spent his entire lifetime there, and if we could perhaps just talk now about the time uh, when you produced such things as the El Alamein reunion and uh, Star Ballroom and so on, Mark. That was in the 50s, wasn't it? That's right. I left the BBC at the end of 1948, I think it was, and took a job as the production manager at a place called the Empress Hall Earls Court, which was a big sports arena and stadium next door to Earls Court Exhibition, which was reopening, having been closed throughout the war. And that was how I became introduced to producing those kind of programs, because they used to hire the building out. It was an ice rink uh, as well, but I wasn't involved in that side of it. No. And that was how I came involved in producing all those kind of, uh, what I suppose you could call stage shows. This El Alamein reunion was an annual... Uh, an annual event for all the chaps who fought at the Battle of Alamein. I, I do remember it being broadcast. Was it televised as well? It, in later years, televised as well. Yeah. Yeah. Was that an enjoyable period of time for you? I mean, compared to radio work? Uh, yes, it was, because um, one's got to remember that at the time I left the BBC, uh, I think about 1948, 
Uh, all the chaps who'd been serving in the forces, regular members of the BBC staff, BBC staff and who had survived the war were all coming back and naturally coming back into jobs that they already held very rightly and properly. Uh, people like me who'd come in as it were stopgap arrangement during the war uh, obviously took second place so I mm. could see that if I was going to stay with the BBC which I had an opportunity of doing it was going to be ages and ages and ages before anything um, you know really interesting happened to me because all these chaps quite rightly were coming back to their jobs this yeah. thing came up at the Empress Hall and I just took it as an opportunity of getting experience in a different field yes and of course another field you've worked in uh, along with all these things is the record industry um, when did you start record production? Well, uh, I was five years at the Empress Hall Earls Court, and then I left and, and uh, very daring and thought I'd have a go as being a freelance producer of, of whatever anybody wants to hire a freelance producer to do. The BBC were very good and uh, offered me some work, and I continued to do the things that you've referred to for the people at Empress Hall, like Gal Alamein and the Star Ballroom Championships and things, all on a freelance basis. And at that time, uh, this was the beginning, the very beginning, of what later was called the trad boom. Yes. And the record companies were getting very interested in recording trad bands. And uh, Dacker, at where I knew quite a number of people, w wanted to get in on this, and they were busy and short-staffed, and they rang me up one day and said, would like to come and have a talk, and to cut a long story short, they brought me in as a freelance producer to produce records with people like uh, George Melly and Mick Mulligan and uh, Kenny Ball and all those sort of people of that era. That was how I started in making records. Yes, and these are people you'll have met in the prior years with the jazz program. That's right. It? Yeah. Uh, then you went on to uh, meet such people as George Melacrino and Ronnie Aldrich and, and uh, all that uh, big orchestra scene, really, I suppose. Um, the techniques would be somewhat different, I suppose, uh, dealing with these huge, great orchestras compared with the small line of the jazz uh, group. Well, strangely enough, you, you, not all that different. Um, simply just more of everything. In other words, we were already, by the mid-50s, into the multi-microphone era. In fact, we were into that in the late 40s, even in the BBC. So. Uh, not all that different really David it just simply meant that the more musicians and singers you had in the in the studio the more mics you needed you also must have gone through the period where equipment was getting better and better and facilities in the studios were getting better and better yes that's right and of course we were into tape but only ordinary straightforward mono tape no fancy 42 track machines and all those kind no. of things but you've worked with those since I presume since I have yes yes do you, do you like the modern trappings uh, in comparison to the old uh, sing it through a piece of cardboard stuff? <laughs> there are still, I think, great advantages in doing it the old-fashioned way, as I call it, but you'd be hard put to it now to find a competent engineer who could in fact still do it in the old-fashioned way. But I've got to say that there are things which you can only do using multi-track, and you mentioned Ronnie Aldrich and the Ronnie Aldrich two piano records, which is mm -hmm. something which I started with Ronnie at Decker. Now, something like that, really, you can only do with successfully with multi-tracking facilities. Yes. Do they take a, a lot of uh, sessions? you have a lot of takes on those uh, recordings, or are they uh, fairly easy to run through? It takes um, a good fortnight to produce a Ronnie Aldrich album of 12 titles. Yeah. You have three to four sessions with the musicians laying down the music tracks. Mm. You then have, again, three to four sessions with Ronnie himself listening to the music that's already been put on tape and don't forget he's got to do it twice over on each title because he's got to put two different piano parts on so you've got all this then on your multi-track your 12 titles with everything on it then you have to play this all back and remix it and master it down to the final stereo master tape and that's a fortnight's hard work mm. enjoyable work but hard work the end result of course is worth it isn't absolutely it? yeah what about the state of the record industry itself now? It's in some sort of flux condition, isn't it, really? I mean, the takeovers and people um, going out of business. and um, I mean, after all, records are very, very expensive, I think, these days. I find it difficult to believe that the companies are not able to keep going on a good commercial basis, but they seem to be falling by the wayside. Well, I think it's their own fault. They've got themselves into a terrible, terrible mess. And you have only it, it got to... Um, Every week here at Manx Radio, we have a weekly meeting with the various presenters and DJs when all the current week's uh, singles and albums are played through, checked to see what is suitable for us to play and what is not. 
and uh, I don't know, sometimes we might have anything between 20 and 40 singles and albums to go through, and two-thirds of it will be rubbish, and they all cost a lot of money to make, and one wonders why anybody ever bothered to go into the studio and do it, because the radio stations just don't play them. Yeah. Uh, so one can only conclude that the record business has got itself into the hands of a lot of whiz kids. <laughs> And what is its future then? I mean, there are going to be developments, presumably, with um, miniaturization in, in, in this area of uh, records and tapes and so on. Oh, we're in, into microchips, are we? <laughs> well, I suppose they've got to come into the record business. Yes, I suppose so. Um, digital recording, of course, is the, is the current what thing. What is digital recording? I was hoping you weren't going to ask <laughs> me that. Uh, all I can tell you about it is that it is the, uses the same principles as you use in computers and other uh, forms of communication of that sort, which is that the sounds that come out of the studio don't go onto the tape in the old-fashioned way as musical notes, they go onto the tape as a series of electronic sounds, and then they are converted back again when the thing is remixed for the master, and theoretically you are saving a process, and theoretically therefore the ultimate result should be cleaner and freer of tape noise and all the other things that engineers are always grumbling about. And do you reckon they are? Well, you can't hear it on my set, but then I don't have a very expensive set. <laughs> no, because the communications business is going through a revolution, I suppose. Uh, let's move to television, which is perhaps the most important uh, means of communication, mass media th these days. Um, your experience with television was when? In the 60s, I suppose. No, in the 50s. 50s. Uh, yeah, yeah, that again was uh, during my sort of freelance period before I went back to the BBC. Mm. Um, and the very first show was the very first Jack Jackson program, which was on the very first Saturday that ITV opened in 1955. Now, I, d I must admit I can't remember that. What was the formula of that Jack Jackson show? Well, the formula really what we attempted to do was to present a television version of his radio show, oh, yes. which meant that Jack would put together various little funny loony sequences with all bits of records chopped up and put onto tape, and we had people like uh, Glenn Mason and Libby Morris who used to mime to all these little bits and pieces, little mini sketches, yes. and these were interspersed with what I would call whole records, so that you would have a, an artist in the studio miming to his or her latest record. Dickie Valentine had a new record, he'd come in and do his record complete and Jack would say, great, thank you Dickie, hope it's a great success and go into another sort of sketch. Suppose you had a few people who were terrible mimers, did you? Were One they? or two, but on the whole they were surprisingly good because mm. one's got to remember that uh, although none of these people had film experience, miming has been in musical films have all been mimed yes. uh, since the mid-thirties, so there's nothing actually new about it. You see, the public wasn't really aware of miming until, for relatively recent times. Now, if you look back at some of the, uh, the old films, you say, oh, he's miming. That's right, yes. But, of course, we didn't really notice it the first time around. No. Um, this Jack Jackson show ran for quite a number of years, didn't it? Five years. Yeah. What other shows did you have on TV? Uh, well, when that finished, I was a freelance, you see, so that was my only television show during that period. Then when that finished, um, I moved over to, uh, also as a freelance, working for Granada. <coughs> um, I moved over to take over a show which was already in existence called Spot the Tune, which uh, featured Marion Ryan, you may remember. Yeah. Um, and also I did a show called Criss Cross Quiz. Which now that on. one, everyone should remember Criss Cross Quiz. But oddly enough, I don't. What, uh, how was that? That was a... Uh, Noughts and Crosses on television. Noughts and Crosses. Oh, yes. Literally. Yes, that's right. Yes, I wonder why that uh, was sort of taken off. It was popular, wasn't it? It, it, were, it went on a long time. I left television, <coughs> um, I think it was 1963 or thereabouts, and went back to the BBC. And uh, Criss Cross Chris was running before I took it over and went on running afterwards. I think it only finished because, uh, you know, nothing can go on forever, not even a successful quiz game, although if you look through your schedules today, you might wonder whether that's perhaps as accurate as it should be. <laughs> You've been listening to this week's edition of 50 Years Serving the Island, where we featured an edition of Sunday Magazine from 1980. Presented by David Cullister, his guest was Mark White, former head of BBC Radio 1 and 2, and in his retirement years, a guiding hand behind Manx Radio. And you'll shortly be able to hear this program again, along with many other programs and features from Manx Radio's archives, by going to manxradio.com slash portal.